Okay, <clears throat> we're going to go ahead and start. Hope you all had a really good weekend. Just a reminder, you all have um, your first current event assignment that's due um, essentially at the end of the day today, so by midnight. Um, I've already received assignments from a lot of you, and uh, all the questions that I've received are pretty much case-by-case -case basis, so I don't think there's any clarification that I need to give all of you at this point, but I'll be checking my email throughout the day, so if any of you do have questions, please, um, please let me know. So hydrodynamics of estuaries. Today we're going to be talking about essentially flow of fluids in estuaries. Um, my lecture for today is pretty short. Most of today is actually going to be an activity. So the concepts today, um, we're going to review estuaries and density concepts from your intro to oceanography class. Make sure everybody is up to date on those. We'll talk about classification of estuaries by circulation patterns. And then we're going to do that activity I mentioned. We're going to explore some data um, related to, to salinity and tides in York River, which is in the Chesapeake Bay. And then finally, I have a case study I wanted to share with you all um, to talk about how flow in estuaries can be related to real human problems. And so we'll be talking about impacts of Mississippi River flooding in 2019 in the last few slides of class today. The learning goals are to understand that estuaries can be classified by varying levels of flow and mixing, that tides move through estuaries in dynamic and interesting ways, the rivers feeding into a bay add their own dynamics to the flow in estuaries, and that estuarine dynamics can lead to consequences for real people. So um, this week you have assigned two chapters to read, um, chapter four and five. And in chapter four, which you have not read yet, but you're going to get to, you'll um, read about how the Spanish, in looking for the Mississippi River, actually sailed right into the mouth of the river, right into the delta. But they didn't realize that they had discovered the Mississippi. Um, part of the reason for that is there is a large, muddy freshwater plume. So you can see here. Um, some of the extents of that mud that's flowing out of the Mississippi River. Um, that, that large muddy freshwater plume extends far beyond the mouth of the river, and that might have concealed its exact location for people sailing through some of that mud. So that's going to relate to some concepts that we'll be talking about today in our estuarine hydrodynamics lecture. And when I say hydrodynamics, it's a really complicated, jargony word that just pretty much means motion of fluids. So in an estuary, we're going to be talking about essentially two different types of water masses, two different types of fluids. We're going to talk about fresh water and salt water. And that's because if you recall, an estuary, um, pretty much the definition of an estuary, is a body of water that occurs in coastal environments where fresh and salt water mix. So estuarine hydrodynamics, we'll be talking about the motion of salt and fresh water in coastal environments. To briefly review density, you spent a lot of time in intro to oceanography talking about density. Um, so I'm just going to briefly review it here. So density, as you learned um, in the past, is a key concept for understanding the physical structure of the ocean. It is the mass per unit volume of a substance, and as such, it's an expression of the relative heaviness of a substance. You learned that that's important for the structure of the ocean because the ocean is density stratified based on temperature and salinity. If you have large differences in temperature or salinity between a couple of different water masses, that means that those water masses have very, very different densities and those different densities can prevent those two water masses from mixing. And so if that happens, you might get something called a picnocline, which you should recall from Intro to Oceanography, where you get a density gradient. So here on the left, I'm showing you a density gradient where there's low density at the top, 
and high density at the bottom. That's how densities, um, different density fluids sort themselves out in the water column. And the density differences can be caused by temperature if you have a thermocline. So low density water tends to be warmer, so you get the warmer water at the top. But perhaps more relevant to estuarine hydrodynamics, you can also get a density difference due to salinity. And so that would be called a halocline, where you get fresh water, so relatively low salinity water at the top. That low salinity water is less dense, so it sits right on top of the saltier, more dense water. So that's just a brief review of some concepts that you should remember from before that will apply for today. So let's see how this relates to estuarine circulation. So you have some pretty typical patterns of water movement in an estuary. And these are based on the freshwater flow. So the direction of flow, how much flow there is. Um, also the tides. So that's going to be a force that's moving water in or in and out of a coastal environment that might cause some mixing. And then also winds. Winds are really important for water move, movement, especially in shallow areas. Um, so you can imagine that winds play a major role in mixing in, in estuarine environments. The typical case, and we'll talk about variations on this typical case next, but the typical case is that more dense seawater, so from the sea, will travel landward along the bottom of an estuary. So it's that water, it's denoted here by this darker, darker area. The salt water is traveling on the bottom, it's more dense. And then less dense fresh water is going to travel seaward along the surface of the estuary. So that means you have these two bodies of water that are meeting, but they're not necessarily immediately mixing together. They might be separated for a while, traveling actually in different directions and in different locations within the water column. But there can be varying levels of mixing, and this really depends on the amount of movement. Um, so the amount of wind activity, the amount of tidal activity, and also the uh, you know, the ultimate density differences between the two bodies of water. If we have completely fresh water and super, super salty water, those two water masses are going to resist mixing more than if we have, um, you know, fresh water and then some sort of brackish or, you know, not full strength um, salinity water. So depending on your level of mixing, um, you may have cases where uh, you have the whole water column completely mixed, but more often than not, what you end up getting is that salinity on the surface is different from salinity at the bottom of the estuary. This image here is showing you how we like to represent that in um, sort of like in space and time um, through ISO lines. And so if you see lines like this on an image um, showing you something like salinity, you can expect that each one of these lines represents an area with constant salinity. So for instance, if you were to capture a salinity um, profile from the top to the bottom at this location here, you would expect to be in a um, different salinity bracket if you're sampling up here than if you were sampling down here. And that's denoted by the separation of this isoline of those two bits of water. So these isolines could mean different things. If this was showing you something quantitative, there would be some numbers assigned to these, like this might be 20 parts per thousand, and maybe this would be, um, you know, uh, 25 parts per thousand, but those are what isolines mean. All right, so now we're getting into some of these cases, um, some of these scenarios where you get different classification of estuaries depending on their level of mixing. A, um, I have four different types of estuaries to show you here. So a salt wedge estuary is the top case. And so in this case, we have salt water intruding in a wedge along the bottom. And freshwater flow, a lot of freshwater flow, is strong enough to prevent that salt water from reaching the surface in the estuary. So you can see this freshwater is moving in a lens 
all the way out, um, you know, past the mouth of whatever estuary we're looking at. So that would be a salt wedge estuary, typically characteristic of a system that has a lot of river flow, a lot of freshwater flow. This is an example of, in, in B here, a highly stratified estuary. And so in this case, you can see there is salt water in this estuary. It's sitting in a pool on the bottom. And then we have this thin layer of fresh water that moves just pretty much just along the surface some ways until eventually it mixes in with seawater. You don't really get that wedge look. It's pretty much, um, you know, a layer of salt water and a layer of fresh water sitting right on top of it. So this is typical when there's some sort of barrier to salt water intrusion. So you can see here there's a sill in this estuary that prevents salt water from moving in and out with the tides. And so what you get is you get salt water slowly trickling in over the sill, filling up the bottom of the estuary, and you get um, this sort of stratification pattern. So that sill is really limiting the amount of mixing that can happen from winds or from tides. In C here, we get a um, partially mixed estuary. So this is a case where we have sort of a salt wedge, but there's a lot more mixing happening. And so you're starting to get, um, you know, a case where the fresh water doesn't extend all the way out to the mouth of the estuary, but you still get kind of those wedges forming. So here's like a wedge of, of salt water. And then here's a wedge of salt water mixing with fresh. Here's a wedge of slightly fresher water, and then you get your wedge of fresh water. So that would be a partially mixed estuary. Somewhere between a salt wedge and the next case, which is a well-mixed estuary. And in this case, the salinity is similar at the surface and at the bottom at all points in the estuary. You have so much mixing here, um, so much wind or tide activity, that you don't really get any sort of impact of those density differences. Any questions on this? I'm almost certain that you all have never received this material before, so. Excellent. Thanks, William. All right, so here are some examples of each type of estuary that I was talking about. Um, salt wedge estuaries would be the Mississippi River Delta, the Columbia River Delta. So Mississippi River Delta is right here. You've seen lots of pictures of that. The Columbia River Delta is uh, the rivers between Washington State and Oregon State. And then um, the Rhone, or we call it the Rhine River Delta, so that would be in Europe. Uh, note that all of these are river deltas because salt wedge estuaries tend to happen in areas where you have strong river flow, so that makes sense. Partially mixed estuaries would, some examples of those would be um, Puget Sound, which can be found, it's a sound that Seattle sits on. Uh, the Chesapeake Bay, which you've seen um, is on the east coast of the United States. We've used that as a, an example several times and the Changjiang River Estuary, and so this is an estuary that drains into the East China Sea. And so these are all estuaries that are um, somewhat open. They certainly have rivers draining into them, but they're not deltas, so um, they may not have strong river impact. And um, they're somewhat open to the sea, but there's always some sort of constriction. Like you can see here, the Puget Sound has a kind of narrow opening for seawater to get in. And then some examples of well-mixed estuaries would be the Albemarle Pamlico Sound. And so this would be located 
in, here we go, in um, the Carolinas, Delaware Bay, which of course located in Delaware, and the Godavari River estuary in India, draining into the Bay of Bengal. So you'll note that these estuaries have relatively large openings. So like, for instance, Delaware Bay um, has one major river feeding into it and a very large opening to, um, to the ocean. And so that would be characteristic of a well-mixed estuary. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for salt water to get in and to mix. And then this little mistake here that I've got going on, I was going to ask you, um, based on what you know about highly stratified estuaries and the way that this looks with the sill here, what kinds of estuaries do you think would be highly stratified? Does anyone have a, a guess? Looks like Caleb is typing. I'm looking for like a major category of, of estuary, estuary types, but you can give me specifics if you want. Exactly, so no, not stupid at all, you're right on. So an estuary that was formed by glaciers, so of course that would be fjords, because they have that sort of sill, um, the moraine, where the glacial deposit was left at the entrance to the estuary, right? So they have this characteristic sill and fjords, and that would be an example of a highly stratified estuary. In fact, oftentimes this category of estuaries, they just call it fjord circulation. So, yep. Yep. Um, so any, any estuary that would have a, some sort of sill happening, I'm sure it would happen with tectonic estuaries as well because you would have a lot of activity pushing land up in certain cases. Um, that would be, that could be an example too, but fjord, fjord, I would say, um, pretty much every fjord has a pattern that is highly stratified. Nice work. So it would be an example of a highly stratified estuary, and that would be a fjord. Okay, so at this point, I want to let you explore um, some patterns of tidal activity and salinity stratification in a real estuary. And in this case, we're going to use York River. Um, in your top hat under week four, eight in class, you'll see the assignment. I'm introducing you to York River, giving you a bit of reading about tides and estuaries and letting you step through and decide for yourself how these types of things work. I'm gonna give you quite a bit of time to do this. Um, so I'm thinking something like, 15, maybe 20 minutes. There are a lot of questions on here. Um, so I'll be around when you guys have questions. Go ahead and work through that activity. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and go over these. Um, so the first questions um, asked you to follow a high tide up through the bay. And the first question was where, at what time is the high tide at the mouth of the bay? And for me, I thought that what, that occurred sometime between eight and 9 a.m. where you see this yellow water at the mouth of the bay. And then you were asked to watch that high tide, which really showed up as greens, work its way up through the bay. And so you can kind of watch it travel up through the bay. And that reaches the northern tip sometime around, I think it was 2200. Yeah, sometime around here. So you can see the brightest greens now are at the northern tip. 
of the um, Chesapeake Bay. And I mean, it's a lot of it is up to interpretation. If you didn't get those exact numbers, you were plus or minus an hour, you're still, you're still spot on. Um, I asked which location has higher tides. That was pretty clear. The mouth of the bay has those brightest greens and sometimes even yellows. Whereas the northern tip of the bay tends to have the darker greens at, at high tide. So the mouth of the bay has the higher tides. And that is because it is closer to the place where the tides are generated, which is at the mouth of the bay, at the location where the bay meets the ocean. The next part I had you watch a animation that showed how water flows over the surface of the York River and also has these cross sections where you can see where the um, highest salinity water is at the bottom in these dark reds and how the lower salinity water flows over top. And so um, the questions were related to how salinity travels through the York River. Um, the tidal flow affects salinity throughout the river because as the tide comes in, salinity increases. As the, as the tide goes out, the salinity decreases. You see that high salinity water move up through the river from the mouth during when the tide's coming in, and you see that blue um, low salinity water come down through the river when the tide's going out. I asked you to study the changes in salinity throughout the day, especially the range of salinity seen in different parts of the river. And I specifically asked you to look at those isolines for this question and how, how they traveled. In which region are there the greatest changes in salinity seen throughout the day? And the answer to this was going to be from point three northward. So if you watch this again, you can see that there are more isolines moving through this section from point three northward, which means you have a wider range of salinity in this section than all of the other options. So isolines are your friend. Study the cross sections. How does water get mixed from top to bottom? Um, so what I wanted to get at here was, um, oops, 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 there we go. In deeper areas, you tend to have high salinity water collecting at the bottom in some form of stratification. In shallow areas are pretty well mixed. And then um, if we're looking at the area that's further upstream, so at three here, this tends to be a lot better mixed than the area that's closer to the mouth at the bottom here. This experiences a lot more stratification. Um, that makes sense because there's going to be higher salinity water entering the bay from the mouth, and so you're going to get a greater density difference, and so more stratification. And then this um, York River is a, um, it's actually classified as a partially mixed estuary. Um, so there are times where that fresh water doesn't make it all the way to the, to the mouth on the surface. You saw there were some pretty high salinity water coming in. Um, however, there is stratification and there are locations that are pretty well mixed and experience a lot of fresh water input all the way to the bottom. And so that would be something in between a salt wedge and a well mixed estuary. So we would classify this as partially mixed. All right, let's step through the last few slides here. I wanted to give you a, um, an idea of how these concepts can be related to like real, real human lives. Learned a lot of oceanography today. Why does it matter? Okay, so it matters because of this case study, the flood of 2019. Um, so when the Mississippi River level gets too high, what we can do about it, well, you know, our government, is that water can be released into the surrounding land to prevent the Mississippi River from overtopping its banks. So the Army Corps of Engi Engineers actually operates the spillway called the Bonacare Spillway for this purpose. They can open it up, relieve some of that flooding in the Mississippi River. And in 2019, there was record flooding in the Mississippi. Um, if you were around in this area, you probably heard about it in the news like all the time. Um, and in 2019, the Army Corps of Engineers opened up the spillway for a total of 123 days, which was a record 
they had two separate periods of time that that spillway was open to relieve some of the impacts of this flooding. So that released a lot of fresh water into areas beyond the Mississippi River. And it actually led to some consequences for fishermen and coastal inhabitants. So um, blue crab and shrimp harvest declined drastically after these spillways were opened. There was nearly 100% mortality of oysters in Mississippi and Alabama. So all the way in Alabama, coastal Alabama, they were experiencing problems. There were hundreds of dead dolphins and sea turtles found washed onto shore. And there were toxic algal blooms in Mississippi that closed beaches for most of the summer. So there were huge impacts of the decision to do this thing here in Louisiana. So my question is, why were the impacts of the decision to open the spillway felt all the way over in Alabama? And the answer is uh, estuarine hydrodynamics. So the fresh water released in the spillway is much less dense than the surrounding seawater and it resists mixing. The freshwater lens traveled along the Mississippi Sound. So the Mississippi Sound is the area of the northern Gulf of Mexico between the coast and barrier islands. I'm pointing to it right here. This would be the Mississippi River Delta and over here would be Mobile Bay, Alabama. And so that freshwater was released and traveled along the Mississippi Sound. And um, you could actually see it in satellite imagery because the sediment travels along with the freshwater. And so you can see the sediment bloom kind of traveling along the coast here where typically you'd only get that sediment released at the Delta. Instead, when the spillway is open, you see it through Lake, Lake Pontchartrain and along the Mississippi Sound. And so because of these density differences, the freshwater lens was allowed to travel all the way along the coast to Alabama where it caused these issues. Interestingly, uh, Mississippi and Alabama both sued the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers over the decision to open the Bonacare spillway in 2019. Louisiana later joined as a defendant. This is an ongoing thing. It hasn't been settled in the courts yet. An environmental lawsuit is kind of interesting because um, it's really a lawsuit that's there to settle a dispute over an environmental resource. It's usually not there for one state to get a bunch of money from another state. So it's not really like Alabama's trying to get a bunch of money from Louisiana. Really, they want to force lawmakers, legislators to change laws or to pause the activity and force a closer, closer look at it in the courts. So it's just kind of their way of saying, all right, let's take a step back. Let's take a look at this. Um, clearly allowing the Mississippi River to flood is not an option. So it's not like we can't open the spillway. Um, or we, we can't put a permanent pause on that. Um, so these openings will definitely continue to happen in the future, and it's likely they'll have impacts um, similar to what we saw in 2019. So I just wanted to give you an idea of how estuarine hydrodynamics can cause issues for real people. All right, I do have a quiz today. I recognize you only have one minute left. So do your best. Um, and then after this, I am ending class. So after you answer this, you can go ahead and log off. In 2019, the decision to open the Bonacare spillway in Louisiana led to consequences for fishermen and coastal inhabitants of much of the northern Gulf of Mexico, including Mississippi and parts of coastal Alabama. These were 150 miles away from the spillway. How did estuarine hydrodynamics result in these far-reaching impacts? More than one answer may be partially correct. From what you learned in this course so far, please choose the best answer of this question. <laughs> 